You're listening to a Shockcast original. Shock. The C word with Kalista. All right, welcome back to the C word with me, Kalista. And if you've been following me on Instagram, which you should, it's at Kalista Lee Liu. If you're not, um, you'll probably have noticed like I am obsessed with like the stars, whether it's astrology, astronomy, just staring up at the dark sky, trying to like look for Saturn or Jupiter with my sky map app. And I love it all. So when I came across a stargazer who actually turns the cosmos into very, very realistic art on Twitter, I knew I had to talk to her. And that's where we welcome. Shahira, hi. Hi. Hi, Kalista. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was mind blown when I saw your Twitter account. I think at one point, some of your art was going viral on Twitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, look, it looks like a photograph. How do you do that? <laughs> it does. If you say that I'm very flattered because actually practicing, still practicing to make my astronomy paintings look realistic. and But in the same time, putting uh, the artistic uh, elements as well in it. Not too much like a photograph. <laughs> okay, you are an artist, obviously, but you also do a lot of other things. So first of yes. all, like, can you tell us about you? Like, what do you do? All right. Thank you, Kalista. So based on my name, Shaira Stageza, you already know that I love to look at the stars. But the things that I'm doing is more than that. I am an artist. Specifically, I do uh, space arts, astronomical arts. I'm an artist member of International Association of Astronomical Artists. I'm a dark sky advocate for Dark Sky Malaysia and International Dark Sky Association. And I am also a full-time educator. So I'm juggling a lot of things because I have a lot of this passion inside me when it comes to astronomy. I've been in love with the stars and the planets and wonders of the night sky basically ever since I was seven years old. So I'm an educator right now. Mm-hmm. I, I, I never thought that I would be able to expand um, my skills in becoming a space artist and also a dark sky advocate, I thought that it's gonna just gonna end there. <laughs> but yeah, have you have you been doing um this for long, or is it like a, a newly? F- because I didn't even know like all these things existed. You know what I mean? Like I know we have the yeah. planetarium and stuff, and I know there are certain associations, but I didn't know there were so many, and that there were they were so active here in Malaysia, as well, especially. Well, astronomy associations are very active here in Malaysia. We have, uh, yeah, like I said, planetarium. We have dark sky Malaysia. We have um, astronomy clubs from universities and also people who are enthusiastic in um, uh, space exploration. We have uh, space educators. Yeah, it, they're very active here in Malaysia. I just got to you know, look up for them a bit and definitely you'll be linked up to a lot of astronomy related stuff in Malaysia. And when it comes to astronomy, it's not really something new because uh, I've been involving myself in Astronomy, ever since I was in high school, I joined the astronomy club. However, when it comes to space and art, it is something that is quite new Mm -hmm. uh, because I started around October 2020. Something, it is very new actually, but not just for me but also for Malaysian. Usually you would uh, see when people, when and the astronomy or space organization, they combine space and arts when it comes to coloring or growing competition, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. However, Malaysians, they never knew that they can actually do this as a career, as something yeah. that they can, yeah, <laughs> they can uh, look forward to in the future. You can actually make this your work someday. Yeah, yeah, that's then- why I, I think when I came across your page, I was very like surprised because, yeah, I, I, I love looking up at the night sky, but that's probably about it. Like I have no equipment. I I just, I have an app in my phone. That I'm like, oh, okay, that's Jupiter today. Oh, okay. Like we can see Capricorn today. <laughs> but that's basically it. I had no idea. Like there were so many layers and so many levels that were even available. So maybe there are other people that are probably like me who had no idea. Maybe you could walk us through your journey. Like, I know you said you've been interested in the sky since you're like seven years old. Like what made you become so interested in it? And then what were the steps that you've taken until October 2020? It's not just me. It's uh, us as a human being. We've been fascinated by the night sky for centuries. Ever since 
ever since we are a human. And um, there's this quote by uh, the poet Roman Vi- uh, Virgil. He said that we are truly becoming a human when we started counting the stars. So from there, when humans look up in the night sky, they're able to make up these patterns, which will guide them across space and time. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that, they they navigate themselves, they travel, and they also um, set time for, say, uh, when to hunt, when to plant, when to gather the crops. And everything, everything revolves around the stars, all of the ancient cultures up until today, actually, even though we, it's not directly, we're not directly looking up at the stars, but mm-hmm. we do rely on the stars when it comes to uh, navigating ourselves across the earth, across this fabric of space and time. This is not just about science, not just about mathematics. It is also related closely to arts because um, before the existence of photography, the only way for astronomers to record their findings, to mm-hmm. record their observations is through drawings and paintings. So it is very important for them to have these artistic skills. And back then, astronomers themselves, they become artists or they work closely to, uh, with an artist so that they can record this um, natural phenomenon as, and they can deliver it uh, to the public or for the public to see and expand the knowledge. Yeah, so this is how I got inspired by uh, space, astronomy, and art journey. I want to combine those two. It is already happening. It, it, it already happened for a long time, but people starting to see the divide. Mm-hmm. Um, people see, they see a huge divide between science and art. So this is where I come uh, as a space artist. I would love to show people that we need art as much as we need science to further advance the knowledge and to help the scientists to to visualize their data as well. They surely need arts. And for normal people like us, we surely need arts to further understand the topic, the scientific uh, Mm -hmm. data, right? Especially uh, me as, uh, as an educator, the children love, love illustrations. So mm-hmm. that's where art comes to make them more interested in science, in astronomy, or any field that they are learning. Were you like that as well? Because you like seven years old, obviously you're not gonna be like, oh, let me let me like think about the science of the sky, right? Were you also inspired by illustrations of stars and planets first? And then like you kind of realized, oh, okay, it's what other people can see with like telescopes and everything, and then it went from there or how did it all start? When I was a kid at around 10 years old, I went to the library because I live in a rural area where uh, the night sky is very beautiful. It is untouched by light pollution. So I look up in the night sky and I was like, oh, this is so beautiful. I need to know more about this thing up in the sky, the stars. They're not just stars. There are a lot of things up there. They're nebulas or galaxies or planets. So I went to the library and looked for books any books that I can get my hand on because it's in it's in the rural area. So back then, especially when there was no internet there, yeah, you have to get uh, your uh, information through newspapers and books. Anything that I can get my hands on related to astronomy, I just gather them and put it in a catalog, like a like scrapbook. Scrap book. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's like a scrapbook. <laughs> Except for the books, I cannot, I cannot cut it from the library. It'll be bad. Don't do that. Okay, <laughs> so from the newspapers, and I see those illustrations. Wow, this is this is the planet. This is how we see the galaxy. We cannot see our galaxy from outside perspective because mm-hmm. we're in it. So we need artists to visualize that, to illustrate that. Um, they're using digital arts to do that. And mm-hmm. that's where I see, oh, wow, this is a galaxy that we are residing in. This is our home. This is our home galaxy. It's so beautiful. And yeah, for sure, any human cannot 
thick picture from from outside of the galaxy, right? <laughs> so there must be a, an amazing artist who's behind this, working together with an astronomer. So when you were, because you said like you come from a very rural kampong, right? So was the astronomy yeah. club that you joined when you were in high school in that kampong as well? Or had you moved out by then? I moved out by then because my parents, they're working and they got posted somewhere else. So I have to follow, right? But when I was in primary school, there was no uh, club, but I made my own circle of friends. Wow. And I... I told them like this is interesting astronomy is beautiful like you guys should come over to the library and join me as I tell you guys about astronomy and I have a few friends who actually wanted to listen to me because I thought that I'm I'm alone liking this stars and planets but I, I'm actually not I I can become the the mentor on astronomy which is very mm-hmm. interesting and quite a beautiful memory for me <laughs> Okay, so you actually started your own little group and then in high school you found an actual astronomy club and then astronomy club, that's where you found out about all these other different associations that you are now a part of? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Through the high school club, uh, astronomy club, I get to know other astronomers, amazing uh, astronomers such as Mr. Shaharin Ahmad and Dr. Mahamarowi. They're prominent astronomers, amateur astronomers in Malaysia. We have professional and amateur astronomers. But amateur are not just because they know less. No, it's not about knowing less. It's about when it's professional, they're making it as their profession. But amateur, they're doing it as their passion Mm -hmm. or hobby or just a side job. Yeah, they're not really uh, educated formally in astronomy, but they're re- really passionate in astronomy. And they are contributing a lot in the astronomy and uh, space science, uh, especially here in Malaysia, if we're talking about the local astronomers. You're very passionate about raising awareness for dark sky awareness. Like, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> dark sky, we're talking about dark sky. Dark sky is where uh, the light pollution is at its minimum or uh, the artificial light doesn't exceed the amount of natural light. Okay. Uh, and this go against with the light polluted sky, which you usually can see, as, especially if you're in urban area. Right now, I'm currently in Jobaru and Kalista, where are you at? <laughs> I'm in KL, so yeah, we know <laughs> what the light pollution is uh, like here. Yeah. <laughs> we are blanketed by the artificial light, by the sky glow. So no dark sky, not much uh, stars you can see because it is filtered out by the light pollution. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you want to go to the dark sky area, you have to move out from the urban area and Maybe go somewhere in, if it's in uh, Peninsula Malaysia, not really much place you can go when it comes to dark, pristine dark sky. You can still oh. get um, darker sky, but not pristine dark sky. Not much here in, Malaysia, in, in Peninsula Malaysia. But if you go to Sabah and Sarawak, whoa. I'm actually from Sabah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so I know like there's certain places that they always say like if there's um like a meteor shower or something like you should go to Kundasang or you should go to um Kudat and places like that. Mm-hmm. I actually, I don't know whether you remember like this was 2017 or 2016 when the, w- there was this phenomenon where all the planets were like aligning. Oh, 20, we do have that um, every... Like it's not, it's every year we can see planets aligning, but there are special times where you can see, um, like in 2020, on December 2020, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Mm, yeah, that yeah. one is a special one. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, <laughs> I remember this one specifically because it was, I stayed up all night. We were at the beach. It wasn't like pristine dark sky, but it was dark enough. And we were watching all the planets and you have to wait until like, almost dawn before you can see mercury so i really remember that it's like all the planets oh, wow. in yeah and it was i really wanted to go to like somewhere further out but of course it's not always easy to 
especially for someone who doesn't really know that much. Like, I think like for, for people like me, we, we just know like the basic, okay, this is happening. I saw in the news, like there's this astronomical event happening. I want to yeah. see it. And we just like, wait, no telescopes, <laughs> no like professional person telling us like exactly where to look. Is the moon going to be full? Are you going to be able to see it? We don't know. <laughs> so I think like being able to just go somewhere where it's like minimal lighting for someone who I guess, yeah, is, is I wanted to say amateur, but not like amateur like you guys, like really, 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 <laughs> we don't really know what's going on. Last year, there was a meteor shower. The Geminids? Yes. Yeah, Geminids meteor shower. I think it was that one. I went to the Bukit Jalil Stadium and I thought, I thought they were going to kick me out. Okay, I might get in trouble for, for like telling people to go here, but I thought they were going to kick me out, but they didn't. And I was just like, lying on top of the car and like watching and you could actually see them it was already like clear clear because we're still in KL but yeah <laughs> you could see now <laughs> yeah oh yeah you can still see uh, even though you're in polluted area and when it comes to a Geminis meter shower or per six meter shower when there's no a uh, moon during mm. that time you can actually see a strike or two uh, yeah. yeah you really have like, to just lie there and pay attention and then you'll be yes. like okay this one <laughs> Exactly. Oh, imagine if you can go to dark sky area and witness that, which is so much more. You can see the fireball. You oh, can that's see, a dream. Yeah. That's been a been a dream of mine to like go and watch like these showers. But I've noticed something, and I don't know whether you know the answer to this. Have you noticed like whenever there's this astronomical events, the chance of it raining is so high. <laughs> Why? Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Like, do like meteor showers like affect the weather or something? Like, why? Like I said, I don't know whether you know the answer to this, but I always feel like maybe whatever's happening in the sky obviously affects what happens on Earth as well, right? It's like when the moon is close, the tide goes in and out. Do you think meteor showers and things like that actually affect our weather? Actually, if you're talking about meteor shower, no, it doesn't affect uh, the weather. The weather is is a different story. The weather will not be as constant as like we are in US. Like they can um... actually arrange a star party for a week. They can actually, <laughs> you know, just be there and Stargaze the whole night and the full week. But in Malaysia, we cannot really do that. However, when it comes to meteor shower, it's actually, it is because our Earth orbit somehow intersect the path where a comet a comet uh, just, you know, uh, zipping through the solar mm-hmm. system. And the comet actually left debris. Uh, debris. So we are passing through that uh, path, not really intersecting, but it's just a path and it ra- the, 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 the comet just let leave uh, the dust and uh-huh. debris. So we're just uh, going through it. And that's where, uh, when the debris just entered the atmosphere and it just, um, burns, when it enters the atmosphere because of the friction. So that's what we see as a meteor shower because there's a lot of dust and debris from the mm. comet. Yeah. And as we move out of the path and we uh, the we won't see as much anymore. And up until we just pass through other path, other comets path, that's basically it doesn't really uh, affect the weather on Earth. But what you're seeing is like uh, space weather. <laughs> okay. So it's just like, it's really just based on luck because like for other countries, they would have more stable weather. Yeah. They have more I'm so jealous. Yep. Yep, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so if we bring it back to this um, dark sky awareness, right? What are you trying to raise? Are you trying to um, raise awareness for our light pollution or what, what's the goal? Well, I'm, I myself is a naturalist. So of course, bringing this light pollution awareness and is not just for the darker sky it's not just uh, to make sure everyone just turn off the lights no it's not about turning off the lights make blackout or whatever it's not about that it's about controlling your lighting your artificial usage of artificial light Mm -hmm. for the environment for the ecosystem and also for the energy consumption like to lessen the energy consumption because all of this uh really are contributing to climate change. When you are talking about light pollution, when talking about dark sky, you are also relating it to the climate change as well because by using too much artificial light at night, we are consuming too much energy. That's a thing. And also exposed too much on artificial light, especially at night, 
during the hours we should be sleeping, it would affect us biologically and also psychologically. When it comes to animals, some animals, they cannot thrive under artificial lights. For example, fireflies, they use their lights, you know, the fireflies, their lights are not that Right? But if you look at somewhere dark, their lights are very beautiful and it's glowing, right? So that's, uh, they use those lights for, mm-hmm. to attract mates. And what okay. happens if there are brighter lights than the fireflies? They won't be able to see their partners, case to see the other fireflies. And this will hinder their reproduction. And we're not talking about plants. The plants need this balance of uh, day and night, dark and light, because mm-hmm. that's how they grow. When they are exposed to the artificial light, they won't be able to know like, oh, there's a light. So <laughs> I'm not going to to just fall the leaves yet. <laughs> I love that we're, we're talking about this when we're doing, we're, we're actually chatting at like, what, almost 11 p.m. And like, I've got this huge <laughs> ring light <laughs> just like blasting yes. my face. And I'm like, you have a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because our body, even though we are we close our eyes when we're sleeping, but our body still can sense the heat from the light. We truly sleep when we're in absolute darkness. Yeah. So our body won't have enough rest when we sleep with the lights on. Yeah. Okay. So that's what the whole dark sky awareness is about. A lot more. It's about mm. astronomy. It's about nature. It's about the ecosystem of human plants. It's about our life on earth, the quality of our life, the humans are served with pristine dark sky. Yeah. And after that, men invented lights, which actually it's a good thing when you are using it moderately. However, people nowadays, they think that oh, darkness equals fear and danger. So they put more lights around them when this is not actually true. But people would disagree with me. However, if you want to know more about how the light and the dark doesn't really relate it to the crime rates and everything. Got to learn more from dark sky in Malaysia. We do educate people on that. Okay, and actually, uh, that is actually what I wanted to ask you next because you recently spoke at like the International Dark Sky Association's 2021 Global Conference, and you told me like it was a huge deal. It was a really important conference. <laughs> what was that about, and what were you talking about? Is it like? A truly global event? Yes, it is truly a global event and International Dark Sky Association gathered who have passion in protecting dark sky. Uh, the researchers, the storytellers come together and talk in the conference and I was one of the speakers. I represented Southeast Asia Ooh, and so our proud. beloved country, <laughs> Malaysia. <laughs> and I'm talking about um, the significance of dark sky uh, in arts from the past to the future and its importance in bringing light pollution awareness. So I'm talking about how throughout the history, uh, human have been inspired by the beautiful dark sky and they've been translating their fascination towards it through works of arts from the ancient times up until the modern times and how arts actually help humans to embed culture and the significance of astronomy and dark sky through arts and also the importance how am I going to deliver the awareness through my arts Mm. which is very exciting because last year we have a space musician talking about uh, dark sky and this year we have space artists talk about dark sky (laughs) space musicians what 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 is that (laughs) Like what? Wow. <laughs> I know, You're right? blowing my mind right now. <laughs> so, um, you know how arts, it, uh, it has, um, this field has a lot of forms, right? We have, in arts, we have visual arts, like oh, I'm doing right now, painting, sculpting, and we have um, art in forms of music. Yeah, in form of music, and we have in form of architecture. Mm-hmm. We have in form of uh, uh, literature. And we also have uh, arts in forms of uh, performance. Yeah, so these people, they like musicians, actors, we all express our passion in different forms of art in their own way, in their own perspective, in a very human touch to something that is untouchable. This is how we are bringing the, the planets and the stars through human touch. 
ding. <laughs> wow. When you said like space musicians, the only thing that came into my mind was, um, you know, the movie Interstellar? Yes. M- my brother is obsessed <laughs> Say no more. with that soundtrack and that movie. He is obsessed. Like he watched the movie like four, at least four times that he told me about. And then he just had the, that music playing all the time. He was a little bit psycho with it, but you know, <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to your brother because I'm obsessed with the music, the OST from Interstellar. I love the music. Kind of bring us to emotionally and yeah, it to really the, to the, to the universe. Yeah, just connecting us like emotionally and spiritually to the universe. It's also the emotions in that movie. It's truly amazing. But Being in Johor, right? Is there a planetarium in Johor? No, there's no planetarium in Johor. Okay, because uh, I was um, going to ask you if you spend a lot of time at the planetarium. Um, I'm sure you have access to like the telescopes and stuff, right? So I wanted to ask you, what's the most interesting thing that you have seen with your own eyes? Like not from a photo. In Johor, there are like islands, a lot of islands okay. in Mersing area. And one of the island is The furthest island from Peninsula Malaysia, it is called Pulau Au. That place is amazing because in Peninsula Malaysia, there are not much pristine dark sky area sites, right? So I went there and for the first time in 2020, I didn't plan about stargazing. At night, I just want to rest, just want to go to the hammock. By the uh-huh, beach uh-huh. Just want to sleep there And listen to the waves And I look up And suddenly I look at The sky It was so dark And there are Patch of clouds Which is Oddly Arranged Vertically And I was like What is that? Okay. And then I Just walk further Towards the beach Oh my god That's the Milky Way <gasps> That is The center Of the Milky Way And I'm looking at it It's like Clouds. So they're not you, clouds. They're not the clouds in this that, like we see during the day. They're clouds of stars, like hundreds wow. and thousands and millions of stars just appearing like a cloud on Earth in our perspective. It's could, truly could beautiful. You see the because the Milky Way is supposed to be like really colorful, right? Like, uh. could you see <laughs> any colors, or was it just like you could just see like the shadow of it? Our, our eyes are incapable to see the colors because it is too faint. When when you look up, look at the uh, telescope, you want to look at the nebulas. You see the nebulas and pictures are beautiful, colorful, right? Yeah. However, when you look through your naked eyes, your eyes are incapable of identifying the colors because it is too faint. The colors you see in the photographs are uh, the data brought out through editing, but but it's not fake because the editing will help astrophotographers mm-hmm. to bring out more data that we cannot see through our eyes. Okay. So those colors are the data. So when you look, uh, when I look at the Milky Way, there are no colors, just dusty, very dusty, white, white grayish, dusty night sky. But it's very obvious. It is vertical. And I can also see the planets, Jupiter and also Saturn. And a bit further away uh, to the... East Mars during that time okay. it was beautiful, beautiful celestial alignments. I have pictures of it. I have oh my gosh, you have, it. <laughs> you have to send it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so fascinating. You should it know. Is. When you know these objects, you know the constellations up in the like, sky, you know which stars are, you know the planets, you will never look at the sky the same ever again. And you always want to look at it. Trust me on this. Please, those who are have like slightest fascination in astronomy, you should start uh, to get to know the constellations and the planets first. Yeah, just just yeah. the prominent constellations like Orion, Canis Major, Horus, right? You can always see the crux. I realize the crux in KL is very obvious. Ah, yeah. there are bright stars there. Yeah, you can see cracks in the southern sky. Okay, so you're into the science part and you're into the art part, right? So I have to ask, you're so into astronomy. Are you into astrology? <laughs> I'm not into astrology because, well, astronomy is more science. You know, mm-hmm. Astrology mm-hmm. is pseudoscience. Back then, we also have astrologers, right? So yeah, these astrologers, they also have deep, knowledge in astronomy right now we already know that 
uh, whatever happened in the sky does not reflect to us on Earth. What ha- whatever happened like in the stars, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, the constellations, the shifting of constellations every month, it's not related to whatever happens on Earth. Unless you're talking about the solar winds, yes, it does affect us on Earth because we can see the auroras and sometimes it can affect the geomagnetic field. I'm not a pro in that, but I know a little bit. I understand the fascination in astrology. Mm. We all want to connect with the stars. Even though it's just... You know, something fun and yeah, just reading stuff and oh, it's relatable, but it is still, it's, it is innate mm-hmm. within us to connect with the stars. And that's yeah. what I find beauty in it. For me, I'm definitely not like a huge, I must check my horoscope every day kind of person. <laughs> but I definitely like, I like reading about it, basically, is what it is, I guess. I, I don't like apply it to every day. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like how I don't make sure I go outside on the balcony and see which star I see every day, I guess. It's just like when I think about it, I'll go and look at it. And I think everyone, whether or not they, they, they say like they believe in like astrology or not, I feel like everybody somehow deep inside still kind of has that bond with their own star sign yeah like they're always even if they look at the, the sky right they'll always want to find their own star sign which is pretty cool yeah to see it. <laughs> that's one of the way to to learn about the constellations like when i'm talking to my friends who are not really into astronomy mm. and like i really want to show them i really want to tell them like what stars are there that ask them uh what's your zodiac <laughs> and they're like Taurus oh yeah look at a blue sky oh there's Taurus there <laughs> and they're like yes I can oh, see it today <laughs> seriously seriously show me show me and I was like yes <laughs> because they're not gotcha. really into astronomy yeah gotcha look at you looking for your own constellations up in the sky <laughs> since you're not into astrology what is your star sign Libra <laughs> okay do you other than Libra do you have a favorite constellation oh wow I love Orion. I love Scorpio. I love Canis Major. I love Centaurus. I love, oh wow, a lot of constellations. I love a lot of constellations because these constellations are the ones that I gaze at because at night I don't really hang out with anyone. So I wake up at like 3 a.m. I just go out and look up into the night sky and stare at it for hours. <laughs> and those yeah. are the constellations that I've been gazing at. And that those constellations like Scorpio, Centaurus, Orion, Origa, Perseus, those are my favorite constellations because they're very they're visible from mm-hmm. uh, the field of view where I, I was. It is very prominent. So yeah, those are my favorite constellations. <laughs> All right, what about what about planets? Do you have like a, a favorite planet? I love the Earth. But, <laughs> however, the ones that in the sky, I can say that I love to look at Saturn because... Same. Because, have you seen Saturn through a telescope? I have not. I've only seen oh. a very blurry photo where you can kind of make out that it's got a ring. And I was like, very sad that I didn't get to see it. Oh my Because <laughs> it was very goodness. new to us very, like, not long ago, right? Calista, you need <laughs> to see Saturn through a telescope because, okay, the first time I point my telescope i have this uh, 4.5 inch reflector telescope okay so this is the first time i I, i'm using it to look at the planets so just setting it up and then i just look at the app and i was like okay uh, there's saturn there i can see it from my naked naked eye so now let's point the telescope to it okay so i have positioned the telescope to saturn and i look through the eyepiece so cute it's so, so you can you can look at it it's still small through the telescope however you can see the tiny ring around it's so I cute really it's so see beautiful it. yes you should oh my gosh you should contact a local uh, astronomy club in kl we have starfinder in kl you should okay. contact them before covid they organized um, these meetups for the people who are beginner in in stargazing and mm-hmm. astronomy they will introduce them to the telescope and binoculars you should join them they should oh contact uh, Starfinder they're on social yeah, media Starfinder yes okay so if anybody else is also like a beginner like me definitely look them up as well I'll try and put like a link somewhere because I was also going to ask you like if there are people who are just kind of curious obviously they don't want to invest in like a telescope 
where would they be able to go? Because is the planetarium open to the public at night? I am not sure about mm. the night, but the planetarium is already open. So you can look at the social media for the schedules and what they can offer you in the planetarium itself. However, if you want to opt for something cheaper than the telescope, you can always try binoculars. You can always try oh. astronomical binoculars or just regular binoculars will be fine because binoculars is a great beginner astronomy tool like if you want to look up and uh, look at the stars you want to want to look at the planets even the galaxy if you go to the area which is dark enough you can actually look at andromeda galaxy through a pair of binoculars yeah wow i have okay, to I show you this photo later on i was actually lucky enough i went to new zealand a few years back and we actually took some <gasps> photos I think it was the Milky Way at that time. I don't think I was like properly like looking through the app and I'll show you later and then you tell me what you think. Show it, it to me. Yeah. <laughs> it was oh my freezing God, cold. It? Yeah, it was freezing cold, but we just stood there shivering, taking photos. <laughs> was it during the winter? No, it was spring going into summer. Yeah. So you get the view of beautiful southern sky when you're in New Zealand. Yes. And the, it was this place that I think a lot of people go for stargazing. Even when people like drove in, they kind of like turned off the headlights and everything. So it was mm. pretty dark. I don't think it was like complete darkness. There was still like lights here and there, but it was quite dark. <laughs> it was darker than I've seen in KL. <laughs> For sure. You see, I, I believe that in New Zealand, they don't really install much street lights, right? Yeah, and actually in New Zealand, I think they don't use a lot of lights because, I don't know, I might be wrong, but it seemed like everybody goes to bed pretty early. Like by 8 o'clock, everything's closed. Here it's like 3am, we're at the Mama, right? So yeah. <laughs> it's a bit different. They are really living like how we should be mm. living naturally. Like at night, it should be dark. We need the contrast of light and dark in our life, right? Yeah. So that's how they, they, they're, they've been living. And this is why I love New Zealand so much. I, I've never been there, but I've been making research. Like if I go there, like where can I stargaze and where mm. can I go see beautiful lakes and mountains? <laughs> Have you been to Sabah to stargaze? Well, not to stargaze because I'm actually born in Sabah. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I haven't been back for like, what, 10 years? Yeah, I should go back to my birthplace. I'm actually planning to because I want to go stargaze in Sabah, especially at the, uh, around Mount Kinabalu where you can see. Yes. I've seen it, really it is... nice photos from local photographers there. Dark Sky Malaysia also captured a lot of beautiful night sky time lapse around Gunung Kinabalu. It's very beautiful. I can't should look at it. Okay. <laughs> if you are someone who really appreciates the dark sky and appreciates the calmness and, and, and nature as it should be, I guess, going to a rural area would be the best, right? Yes. I would love to be in rural area like I did when I was in Sungai so Sok in Kelantan. I was very peaceful there. Very mm. peaceful, very happy. And when you're in city, you know, a lot of cars and fumes and mm. concrete jungles. It makes me like, I really need, need to reconnect with the nature. I need to go somewhere with nature. I have to. One of the things I noticed during the pandemic, when we were in like the first lockdown, it was like very strict. Nobody left the house kind of lockdown. One of the things I noticed was the earth was healing like the skies were extra dark the air was extra crisp and this is just from like a balcony in the middle of the city you know like you could really tell the difference because obviously no cars were allowed on the road after like what 8 or 10 p.m and everything and wow we definitely noticed like the difference in silence the difference in in just like the night sky in general that was when i saw like a lot of constellations like right outside my balcony which usually you wouldn't be able to see there's always a silver lining with everything right so yeah, that was the silver see, lining of the pandemic the human have been Stirring up a lot of things on earth. And when the pandemic hits, we can see the effect, like if we're not around. Like, yeah. That's the closest we can see if we're not yes. around. And we should have that, you know, realization how much, you know, things that we've done to harm this planet and try to slowly, starting from individual, to practice a better lifestyle. 
not just for ourselves, but also for the planet. Because mm-hmm. when we're saving the earth, we're not saving the earth because the earth will thrive no matter what you do to her. Mm-hmm. But no matter what, what happened, it will thrive. And after that, it will heal. But however, us, the humans, when we say we we're saving the earth, we are saving ourselves. We're saving for from sure. our own destruction. And for that sure. includes light pollution and protecting a dark sky. <laughs> and that's what your dark sky awareness is all about, right? Yeah. So I think you're doing but, uh, a great a great job. Like you're you're incorporating so many different aspects because of course we have like people who campaign for climate change and 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 campaign for this kind of things. But I I feel like bringing something so beautiful like the night sky and then turning it into art and in turn turning it into education and saving yeah. the earth at the t- same time. I think like that's just amazing to be honest thank you very much like i have for me as an individual i feel like i have a lot of things to do i have to you know with this skill with the knowledge that i have i feel like i should do something about it mm-hmm. i can do so much more like i want to inspire people out there they can contribute the skills that they have knowledge that they have to protect the night sky, to protect the earth, bring mm-hmm. back the life to our future generations. But that's just it, right? People will want to save and people will, you know, pay more attention to what they love. And I think by bringing the love for astronomy and art, you are able to do that. So I guess that brings me to kind of like my last question, which is for someone who maybe has no idea, like literally from scratch, what would be your suggestions on where to start learning more about the night sky or learning more about turning the tiny dots in the sky that you see with your bare eyes into like a full-blown painting because of course if we bring it back to how I discovered who you were it was from your art yeah what will your suggestions be you see Kalista the, the effect of arts right it's connecting people and you connected you to me and me to you right mm-hmm. so since space art is something that is more focused Mm-hmm. So you got to learn more about astronomy, about universe. So one of the way is through the app that you're using, right? You look at the sky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that itself is a work of art. It connects people to the universe, to the, to the night sky. Mm-hmm. And when you look, look at the app and you just point it to the sky, you can actually see the projection mm-hmm. of what, what's in the sky and it fascinates you yeah so that's very simple you start from the app you can download it from your phone mm-hmm. and always keep yourself updated yeah it's free it's free no need to pay <laughs> <laughs> and you can go to the website such as nasa space.com to keep yourself updated about astronomical news and i would suggest uh, if uh, you're from malaysia you can follow um, fala online fala online it's from our local astronomer, Mr. Shaharin. He always update about the natural night sky or just basically astronomical phenomenon that can be seen in Malaysia, which is more relatable to us. And yeah, follow the astronomical associations in Malaysia, organization or clubs in Malaysia. Like, mm-hmm. like I said, Dark Sky Malaysia, Starfinder, Upper Di Langit. You can follow Astronomy Society of Penang. We have a lot. Like every state has their own astronomical society. So approach the one in your state. That'll be uh, much easier. So get to know more about what kind of, uh, which part of astronomy you know. I focus more on archaeoastronomy and also ethnoastronomy as well as astronomy in general. And that's where I turn my those interests in that smaller parts of astronomy into my arts. And of course, dark sky. Yes, that's one of my main theme for my arts, which is dark mm-hmm. sky and light pollution awareness. So that's a part of astronomy as well. So find the topic, the subtopic of astronomy that you love, that you can focus on. Because we cannot <laughs> focus on everything in the same time. So find whichever part that you love and learn more about it. Because Making space art to learn more about the universe, about the night sky, and this in turn like bring awareness inside you. Like what will happen if we're losing all of this? And that's where dark sky and like pollution awareness come. That's why I want to protect it so much for the art part. Just so you know that creativity is not talent; it is a skill. Before this, I dark sky Malaysia organized a. Uh, 
class, I'm the instructor for that mm-hmm. workshop. While you are painting, you are painting arts, you are also learning more about the subject that you focus on. Mm-hmm. Which that speaking one. of, before I do let you go, if anybody wants to know more and know more about what you're doing or even just see your art, where can they find you? All right, so you can find me on Instagram, mm-hmm. Shahira Stagiza. Just just look for Shahira Stagiza, you'll find me. You can connect me through Facebook and Twitter. I'm very active in Twitter and also Instagram, so it'll be easier to connect there. And you can also go to my website, Canvas to Cosmos. Dot com. Canvas. <laughs> okay. Dot com, <Okay>. yes. <laughs> All right. So if anybody and, is interested in like anything to do with like astronomy, I guess, and also especially for those, I know a lot of people who are interested in art. So I think that's how I discovered Shahira. And I think this is the best place for you to learn more about space art. So I definitely suggest you go and check out her work as well. Thank you. Right. Do check out my artworks <laughs> and <laughs> follow you. my journey of my life as a dark sky advocate, as a space artist, and also as an educator. So yeah, yeah and I, check I out. gotta <laughs> say, Malaysians need to support this because, like, again, Malaysians making us proud internationally. Shahira was the Southeast Asian <laughs> representative, right? Yes, a global <laughs> conference which was huge, and Malaysia is right there. So please go and support. And the sky is very pretty, so uh, please look up at it tonight and see which kind of planets you can find. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, so learn much. more about it. <laughs> yeah, thank welcome, you so Kalisa. much. And I will see you in the next episode. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> the C Word with Callista.